Hello Fleet and welcome back to episode 24 of Know Your Ship with me Chase and today's episode is going to be about the John C. Butler class destroyer escorts. Now before I get to the ships themselves let me first give a huge shout out to now over 900 submarines that are in the fleet. Thank you all for your continued support and when we get to 1000 submarines I'll be doing a bit of a giveaway so stay tuned for that. Anyways back to the ships themselves. The John C. Butler class destroyer escorts were not particularly large ships. They displaced approximately 1300 tons. They were 93 meters long or 306 feet long, depending if you prefer metric or imperial measurements. They were designed to go 24 knots, and they were not very heavily armed. They carried two 5-inch guns, some 20 millimeters and 40 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, and they carried three 21-inch Mark 15 torpedo tubes. The most famous vessel of the class is the USS Samuel B. Roberts, which, as a member of Taffy 3, fought a David vs. Goliath action against Admiral Corita's center force at the Battle of Samar. Now, this episode will primarily be talking about the Samuel B. Roberts as, well, it's the ship that pretty much has the most fame. So, anyways, I hope you can all sit back, relax, and enjoy the story of the John C. Butler class destroyer escort, which will primarily be about the Samuel B. Roberts. Okay, I'll leave you all be now. <laughs> The history and heritage of the Sami B started during World War II with a 21-year-old naval reservist from San Francisco, Samuel Booker Roberts, Jr. During the invasion of Guadalcanal in August 1942, Roberts served as coxswain, commanding a Higgins boat ferrying men and material onto the beachhead. When a Japanese counter-strike forced the Navy to pull back, Roberts remained on the island. Roberts, along with some other coxswains and some Coast Guardsmen, set up a, a post down at, at Lunga Point on Guadalcanal and ran these wooden Higgins boats up the coast to resupply the Marines who were doing the fighting in the interior of the island. On September 27th, Roberts and several other coxswains ferried a company of Marines north of Lunga Point to a beach near the Matanakau River. dropped the Marines off, almost immediately the Marines came under heavy fire. So Roberts and his bunch went back and started extracting the Marines, and the fire was coming off for the beach like crazy. The heavy fire threatened the rescue, so Roberts voluntarily drove his boat directly in front of the Japanese, drawing their attention. The distraction enabled the other boat crews to evacuate the Marines. But then, as Roberts withdrew, Enemy machine gun fire raked his boat and mortally wounded the young coxswain in the neck. His valor in the action was such that the Navy awarded him a Navy Cross, one of the highest decorations the Navy bestows. A year later, they gave him an even rarer honor. They named a ship after him. On April 28, 1944, in Houston, Texas, the U.S. Navy commissioned DE-413, a Butler-class destroyer escort the Samuel B. Roberts. Her initial complement included 222 sailors, including the captain, Lieutenant Commander Robert W. Copeland. Compared to the massive carriers and battleships dominating the high seas, destroyer escorts were both slow and small. This, along with a thin hull, helped inspire their nickname, Tin Can. When you compare a destroyer escort to a heavy cruiser, it's like comparing a little rowboat to a big cabin cruiser. But destroyer escorts weren't built to fight other surface ships. Their role in a fleet was as an outside screen protecting carriers against enemy planes, and especially submarines. They had all the uh, latest sound gear. They had depth charges and uh, they had what they called a hedgehog, which was a rocket-type weapon. After her shakedown cruise, the Roberts set sail for the Western Pacific, where she joined the largest invasion fleet ever assembled. There must have been a thousand ships there, all kinds of ships, aircraft carriers, battleships, uh, everything. This was the seventh fleet, and it was headed for Lady Island in the Philippines. The Sammy B was assigned to Taffy 3, a small task force consisting of six small carriers, three destroyers, and four destroyer escorts. 
The next morning, Japanese ships appear on the horizon. The executive officer got on the uh, PA system. Did anybody want to see the uh, Japanese fleet fleeing and come topside? They thought for a moment that they might be the, uh, the remnants of the defeated fleet from the battle the night before. About that time, it looked like a signal light or something on the horizon. But it wasn't. It was a flash. We could hear the guns rumbling 18 miles away. Before you know it, there's a spout of water come up alongside of you. Then you start seeing masts coming up over the horizon. The Japanese force, mistakenly thought to be fleeing, was actually coming in fast for an attack. They dwarfed Taffy 3's small fleet. Taffy 3's commander, Rear Admiral Ziggy Sprague, looked north to Admiral Halsey for protection, but he was gone. During the night, Halsey had pulled his fleet out of the area, lured away by a decoy Japanese carrier group. Incredibly, he failed to communicate this to Sprague. That left Sprague's fleet of 10 cans, the only force guarding the American troop ships at Leyte. They were essentially cargo and passenger ships, and they had carried their, their thousands upon thousands of troops to the beachhead, and were now in, in Leyte Gulf, uh, all but defenseless. Admiral Sprague looked out at the enemy fleet arrayed in front of him. He estimated Taffy 3 had about 15 minutes to live. October 25th, 1944, Commander Robert Copeland and the crew of the USS Samuel B. Roberts were at general quarters bearing down on them, and the 12 other tin cans comprising Taffy 3 were some of the Japanese Navy's most powerful warships. <laughs> the combined Imperial force brought to bear dozens of 8, 14, and 16-inch guns, far outclassing anything in the American arsenal. The biggest gun we had in our group was 5-inch guns. It would be like a grade school playing football against the uh, Chicago Bears. Taffy 3's commander, Rear Admiral Ziggy Sprague, immediately ordered his ships to lay a smoke screen and to steam away as fast as possible. He also alerted his carrier commanders to get every plane up in the air and on the attack. Some of them had half tanks gas, no bullets, no bombs. They took off to get off the carrier to make dummy runs on them and just try to do some damage to the Japanese coming at us. The dummy runs and smoke screen had little effect. In a matter of minutes, the faster Japanese ships close in on the fleeing Americans. Eventually, the Japanese gunners began dialing in their shots. And so once they found their range, Sprague realized that the jig was up. And he conceived a very audacious but, but last-ditch effort. He would send the small boys after the oncoming fleet and continue to run south with his carriers. Then the skipper got on the PA system, and he told us what was going on. He says, you don't know if any of us will come out of this alive. But we'll do as much damage as we can. Their five-inch guns really had no prayer of penetrating the Japanese armor. But they went right at these Japanese battleships and Japanese cruisers. Meantime, shells are coming right at us. Flashing all around the place. When the Sammy B got within 4,000 yards of the Japanese cruiser Chokai, Commander Copeland ordered a spread of torpedoes. Fire! Several long minutes later, the torpedoes slammed their target. One of our torpedoes blew off the stern of that cruiser, and we all were young enough, kids enough, that we were cheering like it was a baseball game, you know. 
where we didn't realize, boy, this is real. My apologies for the interruption, but I've got to add something here. No matter how hard I try, I can't seem to find any information that verifies the Roberts blowing off the Chokai stern. The best information I can find so far seems to indicate that the Roberts hit the Chokai amidships on the starboard side. The critical damage done to the Chokai came from a 5-inch shell hit to its longlands torpedoes, which severely damaged the Chokai's rudder and engine. This eventually led to her scuttling by the Japanese destroyer Fujinami. Verifying information about the Chokai is made even more difficult considering there are no survivors from the ship. The destroyer Fujinami, which picked up the Chokai survivors, was herself sunk a few days later with all hands. Therefore, there's almost no way to verify the damage done by the Roberts. Elsewhere, Taffy 3's other tin cans attacked with everything and anything they could muster. Amazingly, the aggressive action fooled the Japanese commanders into believing they were facing Halsey's powerful third fleet. Admiral Takeo Kurita proceeded cautiously. Those Japanese crews didn't have a clue what was coming at them because all they saw were these U.S. ships firing away. But it really freaked them out. As the battle raged into its second hour, the tin cans had inflicted severe damage to several Japanese warships, but they too suffered. Several of the American destroyers sat on fire, dead in the water. Casualties numbered in the hundreds. Miraculously, for over 90 minutes, the Sammy B had avoided being hit, but shortly before 9 a.m., the Japanese battleship Congo found her range. From over two miles away, her gun crews fired 1,485-pound shells at the Roberts, hitting as close as 50 yards astern. Huge splashes covered the deck with water. On the bridge, Commander Copeland desperately maneuvered his ship, but at 8.51 a.m., his luck finally ran out. We had an eight-inch shell go through our lower magazine went in above the waterline and went out below the waterline. It went right in the port, out to starboard, and then exploded. But it took the bow up out of the water. Two more eight-inch shells sliced through the Sammy B, causing water to pour into the ship's lower levels. Another salvo took out the engine and 40-millimeter gun emplacement. The gun exploded. Most of everybody was killed. The uh, trainer, the pointer, and the uh, fuse setter was blown out through the side of the gun into the water. All of a sudden, we heard, abandon ship, abandon ship, every man for himself. I looked at a couple of my young shipmates, and I said, what does he mean by every man for himself? We had three rafts go into the water. A lot of the guys come down the uh, cargo net, some of them jump. Commander Copeland and the surviving crew members suddenly found themselves clinging to life rafts in shark-infested waters 45 miles from shore. When we watched the ship go down, it didn't sink in at the time, but we lost our home. And we also lost some friends, and shipmates. He said, well, we'll get picked up. But night came. And uh, I want to tell you, that was scary. Uh, we had no food, no water, no medicines. We had a lot of guys who were banged up. Pretty bad. No rescue efforts came the next day. Several men made a desperate effort to swim for shore and were never seen again. Others, too weak to survive, floated down into the sea. We were in the water up to here all the time. And I was dozing. All of a sudden, I felt something hit my, my leg my, my, uh, under the water. I, I sort of woke up, and I looked down, and there was a tiger shark smacking me on my leg. And I said, oh, God, let me get, oh, God, get him away from me. 
Oh, God. I looked down and he was gone. About 20 seconds later, something like that, there was a yelp. About two, three guys down from me took both his legs off. On the morning of the second day, an American landing craft finally reached the survivors. We yelling at him, you know. And he came around and he said, who won the World Series? And we yelled out, St. Louis Cardinals. And you could hear his engines, the bells ringing, full stop. And that's how he got saved. It was only after being rescued that Commander Copeland and the rest of the Roberts crew found out what had happened during the battle. Four of Taffy 3's ships were sunk. 850 sailors and airmen died, including 90 from the Samuel B. Roberts. However, after two hours, the Japanese commander, having overestimated the opposing force, ordered his ships to withdraw. And perhaps the most one-sided engagement in naval history, the underdog American tin cans had carried the day. Commander Copeland, in his after-action battle report, he wrote that his men had performed superbly. In fact, he wrote, there can be no higher honor than to have commanded a crew of such men. And that's all, folks, for this episode on the John C. Butler class destroyer escorts. I know, I know, I know. Some of you are going to tell me I did this episode solely on Samuel B. Roberts, and I admit I did. And I was trying really hard to find other footage, but there really just wasn't anything out there. So I kind of did the best I could with what I had. Um, I do have to tell you that this class of ship will not be in World of Warships, and so this is another episode that's a bit of like an honorary episode, kind of similar to what I did with the Flower Class Corvettes, and hopefully you guys learn something pretty cool about these little ships and what they did during the war. If you like what I'm doing, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel, as I'll be putting up more videos in the upcoming days and weeks. Aside from that, I hope you all have a fantastic week, and I'll see you all on the high seas soon. Take care.